Ah, I have uh, new papers for everybody. Who wants to pass this out? Come on down. This is an update to, um, I handed this out a couple weeks ago. This is the updated version of it. Uh, those of you watching online can view uh, what's on the screen. Uh, somebody let me know today that they uh, are enjoying the study, and I appreciated that. I really do. And um, I think it helps us uh, to know what our Bible says. Now, as he's doing that, uh, I made a statement a while ago, and I always like to back things up with what the Bible says. Um, I think the world can better understand us as Christians and what we believe if we give them reasons why we believe what we believe. Uh, the fact that a baby's DNA, the argument that a, a preborn baby is still part of that mother's body, that argument has been proven to be invalid because a baby has its own unique DNA. Even though it pulls DNA from the mother and pulls DNA from the father, that baby, that child's genetic makeup is uniquely its own. Okay, so that argument there doesn't apply. It, it has its own, it's just like its own fingerprint. And if it comes down to the mom or the dad or the baby who killed the butler in the kitchen with the knife, if the baby's fingerprints on it, then it would be the baby that did it. Or if it was the baby's DNA, it would be the baby that did it. But the idea is, once that child is conceived, it has its own unique DNA. So it is not, in fact, a projection of the mother's body. It is its own unique identity. Okay? That's, the That's what we know that, D that science has taught us. The facts are, it's its own DNA. The second thing. Does God see life beginning at birth or does God see it as life beginning at conception? Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Um, look at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That's what God said. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. In other words, God had already had a job for this child picked out before it was ever born. God saw it as being a unique creation of his even before he was conceived in his mother's womb. You remember John the Baptist. You remember his mother, Elizabeth. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant with John the Baptist, Mary came to Elizabeth and said, guess what? I had an angel come and visit me. And Elizabeth's going, I know that guy. His name's Gabriel, right? You know, blonde hair, blue eyed, yeah. Well, when Elizabeth was told by Mary that Mary was going to conceive, had conceived child, was going to give birth to Christ, the Bible said, what happened? What did John the Baptist do? How did he react to that? He leaped in his mother's womb. John the Baptist heard what Mary said, reacted to what Mary said. Before he was born, not after he was born. Two witnesses. God says that life begins. In fact, in God's view, God already has life down before conception. God already knows it's going to happen, but definitely as God is for whom God already has a unique identity for that particular child. Has its own unique DNA. That we know scientifically. So to say that a mother, a woman, has the right to terminate that life if she so chooses, that argument is wrong. It's weak and it's wrong. And I think it's murder. Amen? I'm just going to say what God says. All right. And who is God, by the way? Who is God? Who is God that we should obey him? Who is God that we should listen to him? Who is God that we should have anything to do with him? Well, that's what we're here to discuss tonight. 
Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless our study of his word. Uh, you have the study sheet. We're going to start there on, uh, I don't know what page it is. I'm looking maybe page three. I'm starting with number five. God is, uh, let's see, God is above all. Where is that one? Yeah, page three, top there. Number four, God is above all. So let's examine that for a few minutes, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, Sister Linda Toomey has finally moved back to Crystal Oaks. Yay. So she's out of ICU, out of the hospital, and uh, is in the process of recuperating. Um, Janice said that she's still a little foggy, and uh, so they're hoping familiar environment or somewhat familiar environment will help her out with that. Um, so let she, let's pray for Linda. She still has some mending to do, both physically and mentally. And let's pray that she gets all of that back, or at least a good part of it, all right? And pray for one another. Appreciate everybody online. Um, I'll, I'll make some other prayer requests here in a little bit. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, and we thank you, God, for this beautiful day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the warm weather. And Lord, all this pretty grass that's growing, and all these dogwoods and cherry blossoms and everything else, Lord, that's coming back to life again. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing that life to us. You're the one who gives life on this earth. And God, even by your law, it is under extreme conditions when you ordain man to take away someone else's life. They had to have been guilty of some of the worst crimes that we can think of. The Father, to take a life of someone who has done nothing wrong. Lord, it bothers me. And I pray, dear God, that you would return this nation back to honoring what you honor. Back to honoring life. Father, we pray, dear God, that you would bless our legislators, our judges, give them the wisdom that comes from above. I pray that you would bless them as they make the decision about this court case. And Father, we stand against any kind of evil that would choose to take the life of someone who did nothing wrong. So, Father, we pray, Lord, your blessing tonight be with Sister Linda. I pray, Lord, that you would have grace uh, with her. Lord, Father, restore her strength back, restore her mind back. Lord, thank you, dear God, for the blessing that she is to us. Bless us that are gathered here tonight. Bless those that are with us online. We pray, dear God, that you would teach us something that we all need to hear. Prepare us for days to come. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Genesis 14 where we're going to start. God is, uh, here's what we've learned so far. God is the creator of all that is. There isn't anything that was not created by God. Anything that exists, it was created by God. If it doesn't exist, obviously it didn't have no creator because it wasn't, doesn't exist. Uh, number two, because God is the creator, he has the rights to judge his creation. God has rights over his creation. God has the right to give men laws. Um, still to this day, on the door of the Supreme Court of the United States of America is a copy of the Ten Commandments. Because laws derive from our Creator. That's what our founders wrote in the Declaration of Independence. That's what our founders believed when they wrote the Constitution, that our laws must derive from our Creator. We must govern. They realized that they must govern God's people the way God would govern God's people. And God gives men liberty. God gives men rights. Now, God is the one who can take those rights away, and in some cases he does, but that decision belongs to God. So God is the Creator. God has the rights to judge over his creation, and we believe that according to scripture, that everybody, everybody must stand before their creator and give an account 
of what they've done in their life. They give an account of their works, give account of their faith. Somebody say amen. Now, God then is above everything. When it comes to who's in charge, who's the boss, in every, and think about this, in every aspect of life, whether it's a family, a work environment, uh, a group of people living together, uh, they tried the communal system back in the 60s and early 70s. Remember those days? They tried living in communes where everybody was equal and there was no laws and everybody had the same rights to everything that was part of that community, including the women and the food and the money. It didn't work. It never works. People have tried this. People have been trying this for years to live without being governed. Men must be governed. Some cases are not governed wisely. I give that. But men must be governed. Because anytime anybody's tried a communal system where there's no authority, no rules, no laws, everybody shares everything. As soon as a guy walks in with another guy who's with his wife, He's not happy about it. Even though he just shared this guy's wife. He's not happy about it. Because humans have a nature. That nature must be governed. Amen? So it doesn't matter what situation, what area of life it's in. Even children. Children have to be governed. The home has to be ruled. People, communities have to be governed. There has to be rules. There has to be guidelines that are followed. And generally those guidelines must be written down in some form of agreed code or agreed standard or agreed law. At the top of all of that is the creator. It is God. God, and, and I say this in response to, let's say, the Mormon version of God. The Mormon version of God, and I don't know how they explain where the ultimate God came from, because they believe that our God, Jehovah, Elohim, was a man on a planet somewhere who was created to put there by another God. He died, became a God, ruled over this planet, he and his heavenly wives, and that all the, all the good faithful Mormons who do all the, wear the underwear and do all the temple things, when they die, they and their wives get to go to their own planets. Where did that start? With what God did all of Mormonism and Mormon theology start? There had to have been a top supreme God who initiated all of that. Linda, do you know the answer to that? I don't know either. Okay. So if anybody, uh, our friends in Salt Lake City... Let me know what you think about that one, all right? But I say that because the Bible clearly teaches that the God who is over us in this world, there is no other God. There's nothing beside Him. There's nothing equal to Him. And there's definitely nothing above Him. Genesis 14, 22. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord. Notice his title. The most High God, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. So in it, it gives him his name, his title and his office. His name is the Lord. His title is the most high God. His office is he's the possessor of heaven and earth. Heaven means the entirety of the universe. And God is above wherever the universe ends. God is above that, in fact, here's what our Bible teaches us about how big God is. We cannot see to the end of the universe, even with, uh, by the way, did you see the news release this morning about them taking a picture of the black hole? First time it's, they've, they've had artists draw renderings of it, computer simulations of it. But for the first time, we linked some uh, telescopes together and took yeah, all over the planet, and they took 
what amounts to about 15 petabytes of images to compile them together to come up with this one picture of a black hole. So what they theorized, they were right, that it, this thing doesn't exist. But there's, there, I, some of the ideas is, is that black hole leads to a different universe. That beyond our universe, there's another universe somewhere. I don't think so. Okay? At the end of wherever this ends, that's where God is. And he possesses all of it. And there's not another universe with another God. There's not another planet with another God. There's nothing. It is God who is the most high God above, above all things. And he's the possessor of everything. Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the most high divided to the nations their inheritance. So God is the one. And we see this in Genesis 10. If you look in Genesis 10, verse 32. These are the families, the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So when Noah comes off the ark with his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they are the progenitors of the three primary races of the earth, Mongoloid, Negroid, Caucasoid. And out of those three sons originate all of the families, all the tribes, all of the races. So we really are brothers. 20 billion times removed, but we're really our brothers. Okay, if you go, because you trace it all the way back to Noah. But God is the one in Deuteronomy 32 who when he dispersed the nations, God is the one that decided where they would live. God is the one who picked that. Why can, how can God get to do that? God's the most high. And so I want you to consider this question because this is going to get political. Do the Palestinians have a right to Jerusalem or do the Jews have rights to Jerusalem? Who's got a right to rule over Jerusalem? Why do you say that, Brother George? Right. God gave that land to Abraham. Abraham then gave that not to Ishmael, gave it to Isaac. Isaac gave it to Jacob. Actually, God did all of that. Jacob then gives it to the 12 tribes. That Jerusalem itself belongs to Judah. But it's God is the one who the United Nations does not have a right to decide who gets to rule Palestine. It's not the United Nations decision. It's not the president's decision. It's not the Palestinian authorities uh, 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 decision. It is God and God alone. And if you don't believe that, just wait around. Because you're going to see God give that back. And actually, they're not possessing what God promised he would give them. They're not possessing all of it yet. And I believe God's going to give it back. So, And that's just how it's going to be. But God is the one who makes the decisions on who gets to live where in this world. Psalm 47. For the Lord Most High, there it is again, is terrible. Now what, is that, what does that mean? That you should not like God because he's terrible. It says, oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Yeah, I tasted and he's terrible. What does that terrible mean? Awesome. One way of putting it. Great. What else? Fearful. Terrible means he incites terror, fear. We know, according to scriptures, that no man can see God and live. And so when God presented himself at Mount Sinai to the Jews, his own people, and as he began to speak, the Jews said to Moses, make him stop. We are, he, his voice is instilling fear in us, just hearing the voice of God. And they said, Moses, from now on, you go, let God talk to you, and then you tell us what God said, and we'll believe you, which they didn't, but we'll believe you, but tell him, don't talk to us anymore, because it's, it's instilling terror in our hearts. They were afraid they were going to die just hearing the voice of God. So that's what that means. The Lord Most High is terror, terrorful. It's not actually a word, but that's what it implies. He is a great king over Notice this, all the earth. What's above the earth, what's on the earth, what's under the earth, what's in the seas, everything. God is the great king over it all. Psalm 83, 18, that men may know that thou, 
whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Now, look at that verse in Psalm 83 and then turn to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Important to know this? Yeah, I think so. Because, I hate to keep bringing them up, but they picked the fight. The Church of Satan in Missouri files a lawsuit to appeal Missouri law of making... They didn't ban abortions. I wish they would. The Missouri legislature did not ban, did not ban abortions in Missouri. They said... Make it mandatory that a woman who presents herself wanting an abortion, she must wait three days. That's the law. During that three days, the law says that that woman has the opportunity to either see the ultrasound or hear the, hear the, the heartbeat of that child. Not mandatory that she has to listen to that heartbeat. Not mandatory that she has to look at that picture. She's offered the chance. So if you really believe that it's a woman's right, What's wrong then with making her wait three days? How long do they make some people wait in some states to buy a gun? 72 hours? So we're talking about purchasing a gun that we hope never to use, making somebody wait 72 hours to purchase that to make sure they're cleared and they're making the right decision versus taking a life taking a human life why can't we make somebody wait three days to make that decision okay now, i think the law should go farther but that's the law and the church of satan hates that law and they want that law overturned what does that tell you about them okay so who do they worship lucifer right isaiah 14 how verse 12 how art thou fallen from heaven O lucifer son of the morning now notice this God is the most high God. He's never fallen from heaven. He's not going to either. God doesn't fall. Lucifer does. Son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number five. I will be like the most high. But notice Psalm 83. Jehovah. And only God can be called Jehovah, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. You see what Satan wants? He wants to be in the position of the most high. God's not going to let him do it. Okay? And this is not a character flaw of God, but God said of himself in the Ten Commandments, I am a jealous God. Because the first commandment was what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so, yes, the church of Satan is an enemy to Christianity. Because they want their God to be the supreme God. I don't like their God. We all used to serve their God. We all decided we don't like him anymore. Amen? So we went to the higher God, the most high God. We like him because he favors life. He favors life. He favors mercy. He favors forgiveness. Satanism, no mercy. No forgiveness. No miracles. Do what thou, Here's what Aleister Crowley said. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words... Whatever you want, that's the supreme law. And that ain't good. I like the law that says, love thy neighbor as thyself. I like that law better. Amen? That one serves better. It serves humanity better. It serves our society better. It serves our families better. It serves, if the government would learn that law, it would serve the government better. It would serve the people better. Amen? So what's wrong with learning that law? So anyway, so we know that God, Jehovah, is the most high God. We know that His 
adversary, Lucifer, seeks to be like the Most High. But God's not going to let him do it. Daniel 4.17. Daniel 4. Let me give the background of Daniel 4. Daniel 4 is about King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar thinks that he is the greatest. He thinks he's Muhammad Ali. He thinks he's the greatest. He stands out look, looking over his kingdom. And he is patting himself on the back and puffing himself up. But look at what I have done. And then God cursed him. God smote him. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar walked around on his hands and knees eating grass. No king. Then when God wakes him up and he comes to, at the end of that, he says, he said, um, this is not, this is not part of it, but anyway, he says, verse uh, 17, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was, had the divine rights to be king. And God said, I'm going to make you crawl around like a beast for seven years so that you'll know, Nebuchadnezzar, that I am the one who put you in charge. And if I don't want you in charge, then I take you out and I put, I can take one of your slaves and make them king and make them a better king than you ever were. That's what God did with Solomon. After Solomon died, the slave of Solomon was Jeroboam and God made Jeroboam king over the 10 Northern tribes. Okay, so God is able to take the lowest person in the world and make them the greatest king. By the way, the basest of men. How much lower do you have to go when you're born in a stable? When you're born in a barn. And they lay you for your crib in a manger where animals feed. That was the king of of kings and lord of lords and god made him to be the basis of men and has set him up to be ruler in dominion on high somebody say amen so that's that's god's authority there isn't a king in this world or in this universe and even among the gods of heaven there isn't one who has the power to dethrone god they try it they never succeed. Uh, Daniel 7. There were several passages in Daniel that I could have included in here. Daniel 7, 27. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Every king. Now, I'm, this, is, this is political too. I don't like everything that this president does. I don't like most things that the president before him did. I probably won't like at all whoever's going to be the next president. But I'll tell you this. God is the one who either allows it or disallows it. You don't rule in this earth, but what God allows it or disallows it. Why? He's the most high. See, I, I, I told you about hearing. There was a 13 year old girl that died of natural causes. And I went to her funeral because I can't remember who she was related to. Huh? Yeah. Well, Jim Waymire preached her. She had three different preachers. She went to three different churches, her and her mom. And she had three different preachers preach at her funeral. Jim Waymar gave the last message, and I'm glad he did. Because the guy before him was one of these charismatic word faith guys that said, God lost a terrible defeat on this day when this poor girl died. In other words, he believed that I guess her mother or somebody could have spoke life to this girl, but she died without God allowing it. And I'm standing there, my old piano teacher was Judy Huey, she plays the organ over at the funeral home, and I'm standing there back there with her, and I'm just shaking my head, and she's shaking her head, she's going, I don't believe that, and I'm going, I don't believe it either. The idea that God sits in heaven powerless, 
to do anything is unscriptural and it's ridiculous. Why would you serve a God who could not do what you asked him to do? Why would you serve that God? In fact, it almost makes it to where that God serves you. Because in their mindset, that God must do what you tell him to do. Not what you ask him to do. Um, Acts chapter 7. Verse 48. How be it the most high. There it is again. So when I, when I went looking for these verses, guess what, guess what phrase I searched for? Most high. Most high. Granted that there is nothing higher than most high. Nothing. How be it the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So we call this the house of God and I respect it as such. But if we lost this building, we can still be the house of God. We can still have church. We can still preach. We can still do what it is that we believe in doing. We don't need and in fact... We do not need any one thing in this world to practice our religion. You say, what about our Bibles? It wouldn't, it, our Bible didn't come from this world. Our Bible came from heaven. Our Bible created this world. Amen? So, that's what we believe. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. And so you have people who believe that they must face Mecca and bow towards the Kaaba in Mecca five times a day, every day. You must face that direction and pray to Allah who is in that Kaaba. And a guy, I mean, he, he was on a Christian talk show back, I think, the first Gulf War. Definitely after 9-11 said this. I know this is a radical thinking, but why don't we bomb Mecca? If we're tired of Muslims destroying and fighting a war against us, why don't we just eliminate them by bombing Mecca? Because if you bomb Mecca, you have eliminated their whole religion. Because it's based upon that idol existing. And if they don't have that, they don't have a religion. And it's like... Roman Catholicism, you cannot do anything outside of the physical building of the church. We don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that. God does not dwell in temples with, made with hands, saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool, and what house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? So we believe that God doesn't... Did God need this universe? Before he created it? Certainly not. Did God need the heavens? Did God need the earth? Certainly not. God was pre-existent even before that. That's going to be the next thing. God's everlasting. God does not need this world to exist, to thrive, to live. He created it for his pleasure. That's what we learned when we first started this. But God doesn't need all of this. Back in Isaiah 55, verse 8. This is... And this is the last verse on this one. God said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God is highest. He's higher than, he's definitely higher than me. God has the right, and I foolishly give God permission to do this, but he doesn't need my permission, but he's got it. God can establish me or God can set me aside. It's God's. I can live or I can die. That decision is not mine. I don't want that decision. That decision belongs to God. People above me, governments, earthly rulers, kings, presidents, whatever. God is in authority over all of them. 
even, and I don't know why I don't have this in here, but the Bible says that God is even above all the gods. See, there are a creation of beings that are above us. They're called the angels, the spirits, the gods with a little g. But none of them are as high as God. All of them together do not add up to being equal with God. God created all of them. God can destroy all of them. They are God's to do with as He pleases. So is every man, so is every government, every king, and everything in God's creation because He is the highest authority. And I want to uh, you've heard me preach this for years, but I just want to continue to encourage you. What issues you might have with somebody? Let God have it. Let God judge. Let God deal with it. Let God, in a disagreement, let God be the one who decides who's right and who's wrong. That way, if you're right, and God says you're right, you won't be arrogant about it. You'll be humbled by it. And if you're wrong, you won't be mad that you're wrong. You'll be glad that God was able to show you where you were wrong so you could be right. See, it's all about your attitude. You let God handle situations. You let God handle things. People that you can't get along with, let God handle them. Things that come up between people that, I mean, naturally things happen between people. Let God have that. Let God decide what to do about it. Let God decide who's right and who's wrong, who he's going to spank, who he's not going to spank, who he's going to give toys to. Let God decide those things. Let's not be children. Amen? Because God's higher than all of that, and God's definitely higher than all of us. All right? Any questions on that? Any que Rose, you have a question? See, you just went up like that at that exact time. All right, God is before all, everlasting. So, in the beginning, the Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God. So what that means is, before the beginning, God already was. Because if God had to be created... Who created God? Because that's where we get into that Mormon thing. Because they believe that every man becomes a God. Where did it start? Where's my Salt Lake City people? I've been waiting on you. Okay? Maybe my, maybe my watch just not getting the text messages because I thought surely they would have answered. By, or maybe they just don't know. But I would ask that of any Mormon. If God's... If our God was a man on a planet who had a God over him, where did that God come from? And then how far back does that go? And at what point was there a supreme God overall? And why can't I just worship that one instead of worshiping all the little go-betweens? Amen. It just doesn't, it just doesn't calculate. Amen. All right. What, where's my notes? I guess I have to use these. I'm going, I panicked. I'm going, I know I put all this together. All right. Genesis 21. Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And that's the phrase I searched. God is the everlasting God. Ever. So to break that word down. Lasting means no end. Ever means no beginning. So he's no beginning and no end. And that's what is encompassed in that word everlasting. The word eternal is the same as that. If God is, uh, John 3, 15 says that God gives us eternal life. John three sixteen says God gives us everlasting life. The two are interchangeable. And I've heard people 
argue about those two words. Well, one doesn't mean the other. I disagree. I think they're saying the same thing. If you're eternal, you're everlasting. And if you're everlasting, you're eternal. And if there is a, an atomic difference between those two, I would like to see it. But I just don't see a difference in those two words. So God is the everlasting God. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God. See, there's... Now he brings in the word eternal. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the what arms? What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. So, ever, so this is my point. You have the same, you have two words used in the same verse, and they're both applied to God. If God's everlasting, if his arms are everlasting and God's eternal, does that... <laughs> Does that mean his arms had a beginning, but the rest of God didn't? Or, or vice versa? No. God's eternal, and his arms are everlasting. And they mean the exact same thing. But I guess it's easier to describe the concept with everlasting, because ever means never had a beginning. Lasting means never has an end. Uh, turn to Malachi... No, Micah. Turn to Micah 5. I'll give you a... This is why I believe the King James deal. Mike, uh, yeah, Micah 5, and I'll read Psalm 41, 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. So that says it there. From everlasting is before Genesis 1, 1. And then... Two everlasting is after Revelation twenty two twenty one, And it goes continuously in eternity, which is a concept that we cannot even comprehend. Because, see, we live in a world that's governed by time and space. It takes time to move through space. Does everybody understand that? Okay. And it's usually 60 miles an hour. Right? Sure. Depending on how big a hurry you are in, right? But it's still time and space. And everything that we do, say, think, everything is always bound by time and space. So, try to imagine, if you will, a world where time doesn't exist and space is infinite. Both time and space never end, never begin. There's four walls in this room and a clock that governs our time in this space. And that's what we understand. But to imagine where God dwells, where there is no time and no boundary of space, we cannot even imagine it. Can't think of it. I, so when people ask me, what did God do before creation? The question is illegitimate. <laughs> it's not even a question as far as something you can answer because with God, there never was a before or an after. It just is. And see, with us, present is fleeting. Because when I just said the word present, that was five seconds ago. And when I just said five seconds ago, that was five seconds ago. With us, what's present is always moving past us. Does everybody understand that? But in heaven, it stays still. That's big. That's bigger than me. Amen? Bigger than my mouth. Amen? Shut up. Micah 5. Uh, verse 2. This is what Herod wanted to know. Where was Jesus born? This king of the Jews. Where is he born so I can kill him? But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. See, that's what God was telling Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to take somebody that's lowly. I'm going to make them king. 
Though thou be uh, little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel. Is to be is a future statement. Whose goings forth have been from old, from when? Everlasting. That's the King James. That's why I like it. The NIV in this verse says, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Origins. Meaning, Christ originated at a time. But before that time, he did not exist. And that's a lie. Jesus himself said, and it made the, the Pharisees mad. He said, before Abraham was, I am. See that, that name of God, I am that I am? What it means is, God is always present. And with everything with God, it's all present right here. I am. And Jesus said, where Abraham was, I am. And they knew what he was saying. They knew what he was saying. And that's why they wanted to kill him. He was dangerous to their preformed notion of who God was. And he was God standing in front of them. Somebody say amen. So this is why, you would, this is why we don't use an NIV. For nothing. Because it's wrong. It originates Jesus. And everything that we're learning about God, the Father, is equally applied to Christ. The same attributes. God is, pre God is always present. God was eternal, everlasting, and everlasting. So is Christ. God said in the Old Testament, I am the Lord. I am the beginning and the end. Well, Jesus said I'm the beginning and the end. They're both the same. So anyway, 